Ikta Solork is an easygoing young man who is just interested in two things in life, a place to nap, and a woman on his arm. Sadly, the conflict between the Kachvarna Empire and the neighboring Republic of Kyoka destroys his peaceful life. After enlisting as military officers, Ikta and his childhood friend Yatorishino Igsem meet sharpshooter sniper Torway Ramion, infantryman Matthew Tedojirichi, and medic Hiroma Becker on a boat traveling to the military exam site. Little did the athletic youngsters know how drastic life would be for them in just a few days, as their boat sank to the depths of the ocean in a crazy storm. Moments before Ikta and his childhood friend Yatori boarded the ship heading to their military exam, Ikta took a nap on a hammock in between the trees in the small bush. His partner, who is a small cute creature named Kus, wakes him up to inform him to get to the ship on time. A few meters away, Yatori Igsem, Ikta's friend with reddish-looking hair who also hails from a clan of warriors, is seen walking towards the ship with three of her former colleagues. Along the way, they all discuss the battle between their kingdom and Kyoka, their enemies. One of them mentions the great commander of the eastern garrison of their kingdom, Lieutenant General Hazaf Rikan, and talks about his great contribution to keeping the enemies at bay. Ikta overhears them, gets down from his hammock, and complains about the general having to do too much work to keep the enemies at bay. Yatori's colleagues take offense at Ikta's words as they think of them as insulting towards the general. Ikta, who would rather avoid confrontation, lets them win the argument as he walks towards the ship to join Yatori and the others. He stops halfway there and tells Yatori about his thoughts about the entire war in general. He lets Yatori know just how bad things will get for their kingdom if they keep fighting defensively. Yatori, who's had enough of his rants, shuts him up and leads him towards the ship after asking him to help her win the exam against her competitor. Just minutes after the ship set sail for the exam venue, Yatori headed to the cabins to see her competitors and allies. The first person she meets is Hiroma Becker and her partner, Mil Harrow is your typical shy girl whose dream is to become a combat medic. The next person who comes is the brash fatty, Matthew Tedrick, who hates Ikta. Matthew is a guy with self-esteem issues who always feels he's not enough for his team. As expected, he brags about his family Tedrick and tries to make himself a big deal. Ikta saves him from embarrassment and gets down from his bed to formally introduce himself to the maiden Haro. He casts some of his charms on poor Haro and has her screaming from embarrassment. Thankfully, Yatori stopped him from going too far as their next competitor. Torway Remion, a very handsome guy who is Yatori's direct competitor, shows up and formally introduces himself to the group. Matthew gets jealous again and talks smack about his clan. Ikta, who always feels threatened by pretty boys, gets up and talks smack about Torway's looks. Torway, on the other hand, keeps his cool and looks in surprise as his new friends make him the subject of discussion. Eventually, the group dispersed and made themselves at home. Hours later, when it gets dark, Ikta witnesses a chess match between Torway and Matthew. Matthew loses, as expected, and gets angry at himself and the game for not knowing any better. Haro and Yatori show up seconds later to serve the boys some tea. While at it, they all get to discuss battle strategies and things that make a battle much easier to win. Suddenly, the ship shakes violently, and Ikta spills his drink on Matthew. Yatori hears someone behind their door and goes to check it out. Upon opening it, she finds a little teenage girl with blonde hair, and asks where she's from. The girl gets too shy and runs away, leaving Yatori and her friends to wonder where she could possibly be from. Ikta mentions a few obscene things about the underaged girl, but then, before he gets reprimanded, the ship's lights go out. Yatori and her people head to the deck only to see themselves about to sink in a massive storm. Everyone on the boat gets into the lifeboats and loads them on the water. The blonde girl, while trying to get to the boat, slips and falls into the water. Without thinking twice, Ikta and his partner Kus dive into the water and eventually save the blonde teenage girl. Soon after, the teenage girl passes out and finds herself in a cave with Yatori, Matthew, and the rest of them there. Yatori, who seems to recognize her as Shamil, the third princess of their kingdom, quickly gets on her knees to pay her respects. Shamil gives up the act and asks Yatori to tell her what happened to their ship. After narrating all that happened, Yatori asks for her forgiveness for rescuing her without her help. Shamil smiles and reminds Yatori of her visit to the Igsem family mansion about eight years ago. She gets to reminisce with Yatori before asking where the others are. Yatori tells her Ikta and Torway went out to survey the surroundings and they'll be back soon. Matthew, who is freezing cold, humbly asks for his coat back. However, Shamil couldn't give her the coat, or else she'll be naked. Somewhere in the forest nearby, Ikta and Torway discuss the Imperial House as they scout the area for food and drink. By chance, Ikta and his guys stumble upon the Kyoka Republic territory and quickly rush back to report their findings to their crew. After explaining things to the crew, Ikta calms his panicking teammates and advises them to follow his plan, which is to find a way to break through the border and return to the Empire unscathed. That, or they pretend to be prisoners, and just hope they don't get killed before they're used as a bargaining chip to get the Empire to surrender. Upon hearing this, Shamil gets up and throws a fuss over getting captured. Ikta gets worked up, 
and holds her mouth shut before telling her just how bad things can get if she keeps whining. Yatori punishes Ikta and sends him out after apologizing on his behalf. When she finds out he's the one who saved her, the princess lets him go. Yatori follows Ikta outside and asks him what the matter is. Ikta apologizes for getting worked and imagines he went too far to expect such maturity from a teenager. Eventually, things return to normal and everyone gets to have a nice lunch. After filling their bellies, Shamil gets calm and places her safety in her team's hands. Soon after, they all get down to sharpening their weapons and making things that will buy them more time in the cave. Ikta makes a hammock and tells the princess about it. After urging her to try it out, Shamil gets on it and feels very comfortable. She looked at the sky and marveled at how beautiful nature was. Just then, she finds a Kyokan blimp and tells Ikta about it. Ikta quickly takes her and ducks out of sight so they don't spot them while doing their patrols. Later that night, Shamil gets up to ease herself. The Kyokan patrol soldiers trigger an alarm next to Shamil and this wakes all of them up. They immediately get into battle mode and everyone mans their stations. Ikta intercepts the enemy as they're about to capture Shamil and distracts them by pretending to be a refugee seeking asylum in the Kyokan Republic. Luckily for him, his performance fools the soldiers and they let their guard down. When Ikta realizes there are only three of them, he changes his countenance and calls for his teammates to activate Pattern 3 of Assault. Before the soldiers know it, Yatori and the others all swoop down from trees and end them all. One of them tries to escape, but he gets shot down by the team's sniper, Torway. After the assault on the Kyokan soldiers, Ikta and his boys walk towards the last surviving soldier, Irik, and find his sprite partner trying to wake him up. Ikta calms the man down and asks him a few important questions in exchange for getting his wounds treated. Irik, the unsuspecting soldier, divulges everything Ikta needs to know about his own base camp. After he's gotten all the information he needs, he lets Irik go to rest and collects the soul stones from the partners of the three three fallen soldiers. Ikta then carries the soldier's body to a safe place to bury it. Moments later, everyone returns to the cave to recuperate after the fierce battle. While she sharpens her sword, Yatori finds Torway blaming himself for almost missing the second shot in a crucial fight like that and speaks some sense into his head. Then she heads outside and finds Princess Shamil cursing her own bloodline as that requires too many sacrifices from the people it's meant to protect. Ikta shows up and gently kisses the princess's hand, urging her to take things easy and just leave things in the hands of her subordinates. Shamil, who initially thought Ikta to be a rude person, gets shocked after seeing this side of him. Even after he leaves, she asks Yatori to know the exact kind of man he is. Yatori assures her that she'll know in due time. The following day, Ikta takes his friends to a blimp and introduces them to the sprites he recovered the previous night. Once they're all gathered, Ikta explains his plan to them. So he plans to send the manless blimp up in the air and make it fly across the Kyokan border patrol camp. Then, at the right time, he will dress up to be one of the soldiers there and take his friends, who are dressed as refugees, to the general to request safe passage through their border to the Empire and in return, Ikta would provide the necessary information for the second lieutenant to get the blimp back before it flies out of their territory forever. Since the blimps are literally the private jets of Kyoka, the lieutenant of the camp wouldn't be left with much of a choice but to allow Ikta and his people to cross the border to get to the Empire. Everyone seems to get the memo, so they all get in their prop suits. Ikta arrives at the camp as planned and manages to actually pull off the scam. That evening, Ikta gets his team across the border without any bloodshed. However, Matthew complains about his weapons floating away in the blimp. That night, all five heroes are presented to the great General Hazaf who welcomes them warmly to stay over in the palace till they get to see the Emperor. After a full month of enjoying themselves and sleeping on plush beds, Ikta starts to get bored of life. One morning, Torway rushes in with the morning paper to show his people the bad news about Hazaf's death. Ikta takes a look at the paper and recalls the night they arrived. Apparently, he'd seen through the Emperor's cowardly strategy to keep fighting and had tried to warn Hazaf from being used as a pawn for promoting political propaganda. Sadly, nobody wants to hear from a commoner with no social status. And besides, Hazaf wasn't really worried about losing his life to war as long as it was for the Emperor. He ignores Ikta's warning and happily sacrifices himself to be used as a pawn. Now that he's dead, Ikta can at least say he told them so. Even so, he still got out of bed to eat his luscious breakfast. After a few hours, Yatori and her crew are summoned to the Emperor's palace to see him. On getting there, they find Shamil close to her father and kneel in front of him. The Emperor thanks them for saving his daughter and rewards them by bestowing all five of them the titles to be Imperial Knights. This comes as a shock to Ikta, who was super pissed at the princess for trying to patronize him. On their way home in a chariot, Ikta lets it out bluntly to the princess and tells her that he's super pissed at her tactics to use their victory for political reasons. Shamil gives him a smug look and starts talking smack about his real father, Bada Sankre, the well-known strategist and general. Ikta lets her off the hook when she keeps on talking nonsensical things about his master and other friends. But when she gets to her mother, Ikta stops her and threatens to break her neck if she ever talks smack about his mother again. 
Yatori reprimands his disrespect and tells him to keep calm next time. After traveling a great deal, Ikta and his people are welcomed to the military training school and settle in. That night, Yatori sees Ikta personally to ask him about his latest tantrums. Ikta lets her know that while many would applaud the promotion, pissed, as he never for once thought he would take up the job that got his dad killed. Being an Imperial Knight is tasking, and Ikta would rather use his brain somewhere more befitting for a lazy person like himself. The next day, every cadet in the training school is introduced to their new training camp and is urged to do their job to the best of their abilities. After the orientation, Ikta and his colleagues all go for the morning mile run. After getting their knees busted out, they all settle under a large tree in the yard to eat some snacks. Some bullies from the upper ranks show up and throw bugs into their food to scare them. However, Ikta smashes the bug in pieces and eats it right in front of them. The bullies get weirded out and run away. After their breakfast, everyone gets a nice bath and dresses up in their military uniforms before heading to class. Moments before class begins, Shamil sits near Ikta, who is already sleeping, notices the lazy attitude around him. While the class goes on, she writes on her board and asks Ikta if he truly likes his life in the military school. Ikta lets her know he doesn't, and also thanks her for bringing him to a place where he can test his knowledge and make fun of people if possible. Shamil gets a little pissed off, but then the teacher asks her for a contribution to the class. She does her part, and then the teacher calls Solork Ikta to give his take on the strategy used in fighting a certain three-on-one battle. Ikta gets up, and not only gives a detailed description, but also corrects some mistakes in the book the teacher is teaching them. This leaves the entire class in awe as they realize Ikta had more in his brain than all of them combined. After class, Torway and Matthew head to the shooting range, to practice some long shots. Once they're done, they head back towards their other friends and unfortunately run into Torway's elder brother, Sarihas Lagrameon, or Sari for short, who stops them and bullies his younger brother for being the weakest member of the family. Matthew stands there as he witnesses the bully talk smack about his friend. After introducing himself, Matthew tries to defend Torway, but then Sari doesn't let him talk. Instead, he kept on calling his little brother a coward, who liked to hide from the enemy lines. What they all didn't know was that Ikta, who was sleeping on his hammock up in the tree, was overhearing them. When he gets tired of all the brash talk, he gets down from his hammock and gives Sari his own warning. Sari plays right into his trap and gets too pissed to even think of anything. Sari even beats him up and leaves him to beg for forgiveness. However, Ikta only gets up and leaves the rest in Yatori's hands. Yatori thanks him for the honor and walks forward to spar with Sari and his crewmen. After beating down all of them, Yatori prepares herself to face Sushura, the strongest man in the squad. At this point, Sari stops the fight and lives to fight another day. Yatori and her people respect his wishes and go on to treat Ikta's wounds. While at it, they all discuss war strategies and ways to beat someone like Sari. Three months later, the instructors assigned platoons to some of the select few cadets who did well throughout. Ikta, Yatori, and Torway are some of the cadets selected to lead a platoon, and he accepts his responsibility. After naming all the platoon officers, the instructors disperse them all so they can get used to their new officers. Ikta gets to meet one of the daughters of his old flame, Amicia, who was recently divorced. The daughter, Suya, who somehow found her way to Ikta's platoon, chastises him for having carnal knowledge of her mother in her most vulnerable times. Ikta gets back home and reports the unlikely event to his people. He complains about Suya and his platoon members not even taking his orders as they all feel he isn't up to their standard. Rather than pity him, Yatori lets him go and sulk in peace, since he also committed adultery. Ikta goes over to check up on his troops and finds them marching without his consent. Later that day, Matthew rushes over to break the news to his friends. Apparently, the details about the mock battle have been announced and from what he's heard, the mock battle is to take place between two armies consisting of three platoons each to fight each other with paint rounds. Upon hearing all he said, Ikta finds out his platoon is going to be paired with Matthew and Torway's platoon, while Yatori's platoon gets paired up with Sari and one other guy. Ikta calms his team down and advises them to have fun while it lasts. He dishes out tasks to everyone and makes sure they all understand that this is supposed to be a friendly match. After getting everyone's nerves down, Ikta goes out to meet Suya so he can negotiate his way back to be the leader of the squad. He starts his discussion by accusing Suya of deranking him due to personal reasons. However, Suya got really defensive, and Ikta decided to make a bet with her. He asks her to let him lead the team through the mock battle, and if he wins, then he assumes command over the platoon. On the other hand, if he loses the game, then he steps down to work a desk job. Seems pretty fair to Suya, so she lets him at it. In the next scene, Ikta and his team head deep into the forest to take their positions before the next day when the mock battle starts. 
On their way to their campsite, Ikta instructs his men to take off some of their equipment and lay them on the ground, despite the heavy downpour. Thankfully, his men obey, but Suya tries to counter him. Ikta gives her a tangible reason for doing so and ensures she gets the whole gist. After getting to their campsite, Ikta continues explaining a little bit of his tactics to the confused and angry Suya. Ikta lets her know of his plans to intercept Sari's forces at a place of his choosing and tells her to put a little bit more trust in him. The next day, Yatori and her scouts return to report the location of Ikta and his men, which is around the river south of where they're supposed to be. Pisses Sari off and makes him lose his cool as he partitions and instructs his soldiers to head towards that area with Yatori so they can subdue Ikta's men. After getting his soldiers to face Solark's forces, Sari ignores all his subordinates' instructions to test the river for its shallowness so they can plan a surprise attack on Ikta's men, and advises Yatori to split up their army in half so they can head up river and intercept Ikta's men who were doing the same thing. Yatori, who already knows about Ikta's plan, tries to warn Sari of Ikta's plan but then Sari isn't ready to listen to her so she heeds to his advice. Yatori takes her forces as far away from the riverside as possible before she finally learns all there's to know about Ikta's plans. Apparently, Ikta needed Yatori as far away from Sari as possible as he knew she was the only threat that could oppose his victory. When he's sure she's far enough, he has a small portion of his soldiers, which he stationed far off, take out some of her men, and then attacks Sari and the others with the larger portion of his platoon, hoping he takes out Sari, their leader, before Yatori figures out the entire thing and gets back to protect her general. The war seems to go in his favor, as his soldiers step on the shallow part of the river they created with a log the previous night. Sari is caught by surprise, but his troops are skilled enough to defend themselves against Ikta's people. Just mere seconds before Sari gets shot by the paintball gun, Yatori returns and protects him. Upon seeing the terrifying Yatori appear to fight them, Ikta and his troops retreat to fight another day. Two hours later, Ikta and his people settle down somewhere in the jungle to rest and cook up another plan to fight the next day. Matthew, who's dead tired, complains about the fight and wishes Sari would just surrender and let them win by default. Knowing how egoistic Sari can be, Ikta tells him that's never going to happen. So he changes his formation and instructs the combat medic to tend to the wounded. Suya comes by and tries to tell him the loopholes in his plan. However, Ikta lets her know that he's gotten all those loopholes covered. Suya and her two subordinates salute Shamil, who is coming in with her forces and going their separate ways. Elsewhere, Sari throws a tantrum at Yatori and Sushara, his younger brother for allowing someone like Ikta to get through their defense so easily. While they know that it's not their fault, Yatori and the younger brother calm themselves and ask their leader for their next move. Sari lets his emotions get the better of him and swears revenge against Ikta. Ikta, who's read through his moves, makes his plans and commences the next battle an hour later. This time, Ikta stationed his platoon to block the northern exits and prevent Sari and his people from escaping the mock battleground. This should be enough to make them surrender and lose the fight, right? Well, turns out Sari wasn't ready to just give up yet. So he heads directly into the enemy line to fight brute force their way through Ikta's line. When they get there, Ikta orders his men to pretend like they're firing to get their enemies on their toes and then charge when he gives the order. While Ikta and his people wait for Sari to make the first move, Torway takes position several meters out and aims his sniper at his brother's head. When the time is right, Sari walks out in the open and exposes his head to tell his soldiers to cheat and pretend not to be dead when they get paint shot. When he least expects it, Torway snipes his head, and Ikta gives the order to charge. Since their commander is down, Yatori and Sashura give the order to fight their way through the enemy lines. By the end of the day, Ikta's soldiers wiped out more than three quarters of Sari's men, including Sari himself, to win the mock battle. Once the battle's over, Ikta's men give the cry of victory. Ikta calms his team down and scolds a few of them for disobeying some of his orders and doing things on their own. He then moves on to give them all a speech about human advancement being dependent on laziness and the like. By the end of his speech, he advises his men to follow him as he leads them all to victory. Everyone begins shouting his name as they hail him as their new commander. While that happens, Ikta joins his colleagues Matthew and Torway to joke around a little bit before they realize Shamla's gone. Where could she go? Ikta asked. As it turns out, Shamil had been deceived by Hazaf's men and lured away from her protective party so she could be captured and killed to avenge their general's death. Moments before the mock battle ends, Yatori convinces the unrelenting Sari to surrender to Ikta so he doesn't risk dragging his name in the mud. Just then, a bell signals Yatori and the others about the princess's abduction. Yatori borrows some of Sari's men and heads west to track down the princess. They catch up to Hazaf's men and shoot down their front line with poisoned arrows. Their leader, Captain Eisen Ho, confronts her methods and dares her to try facing them instead of hiding inside the bushes. In the blink of an eye, Yatori appears behind him and puts her sword to his throat. Isan Ho orders his men to attack her regardless of how dire the situation is. Thankfully, Isan's men didn't want him dead, so they keep their stance. Soon after, 
Ison drops Shamil and decides to tell Yatori their objective for committing the crime against the Imperial House. Apparently, Ison and his men were very distraught to have their general, a man of valor, lose his life for such a mediocre reason. He calls Shamil worthless and stabs his hand with Yatori's sword before pinning her down with all his strength. Yatori, who struggles to free herself, gets saved by Torway, who shoots the captain in the head. Yatori takes advantage of the situation and swiftly takes down each and every member of Ison's force in one single fluid movement. When she's done with the deed, she checks up on the princess to see if she's good without realizing how much blood she is standing in. Ikta shows up a few minutes later and tries to calm Yatori down. Yatori, who was already freaking out over how wet and red her body felt, drops her sword and thanks Ikta for coming through for her again. Ikta keeps his voice soft and lets her rest her head on his chest. Then, he gets down to talk to Ison, who battles with life at the moment. Ison commends Ikta's tactics and lets him know they're similar to his teacher Bata Senkrai teachings. After his death, Ikta gets up and teases the princess who's red all over. Shamil ends up crying out loud calling Ikta a jerk for trying to be funny in such an unfortunate situation. After the entire ordeal with Ison and his soldiers, Yatori returns to the military school and trains underneath a large tree while she recalls the state she was in just a few moments ago. Her partner, Shia, got a little worried and asked if she was good. Yatori smiles and lets Shia know that she's always going to be good as long as she's around Ikta, as he's the only person who can calm her down whenever she gets too aggressive. Shia stares right into her partner's eyes and realizes Yatori is being honest with her. So, as appreciation for striving so hard to be human, Shia promises to help Yatori out in any way possible. This makes Yatori stop training to reflect on the first day she met Ikta. It all began several years ago when Yatori, who was still a young girl at the time, met the feisty, smart, and troublesome Ikta. That day, Yatori met with her father who had news for her. Apparently, Yatori was to be sent off to Bata Sankri's army to learn the ropes around becoming a full-fledged soldier. After having the talk with her father, she gets sent off to start her training with the nation's smartest general and strategist, Bata Sankre, who also turns out to be Ikta's biological father. Moments after she settles into the new region, Yatori walks up to Bata who is busy overseeing his son's ascension into the skies on a blimp. She discusses a few things with Bata and shows him the soldier in her. Bata chuckles and realizes just how harsh life must have been for someone like Yatori. So he sends her off to have fun with his son while he does his own work in peace. Ikta takes Yatori to Khan, one of the scientists in Bata's territory. There, they talk about some concoction he was making out of random ingredients until Yatori gets curious and asks him for some explanation of what science is. Khan takes her to his study and explains everything she needs to know about science. To their surprise, Yatori gets the entire thing on the first go and gets down to eat the concoction he made. She likes the concoction so much that she asks for seconds. Later on, Ikta walks into Yatori's training session and almost gets slashed in the throat by her. Thankfully, she stops just before doing that and engages Ikta in a discussion. Ikta asks her why she's always alone in the forest, instead of trying to mingle casually with the other kids. Yatori tells him she doesn't have a choice, since there are no kids around her place to play with. Ikta takes her to a small bush near Khan's place and sets three sinkholes for him to fall into. Initially, Khan sees through the first two holes, but then he falls into the third hole and loses to Ikta. Next up, Ikta takes Yatori to an elderly woman's kitchen to steal some fruits. Yatori decides to handle this one and does so gracefully as she steals a truckload of fruit from the unsuspecting woman's kitchen. Ikta commends her hard work and takes the spoils of their exploits home for his mother to cook dinner with. On getting home, Yatori introduces herself to Yuka, Ikta's mother, who invites her inside her house warmly. Soon after, Bada returns home and finds his son playing some chess. Minutes later, Yuka serves lunch and everyone settles down to dig in. Over lunch, Yatori is surprised at how free Ikta is with his dad and wishes she was like that with her own dad. Nevertheless, Yuka cuts her concentration and asks her to join her in making some snacks for the elderly woman after lunch. Yatori obliges and continues eating her food. Later that evening, Ikta and Yatori go fishing and catch a big fish for dinner. On their way back home, the duo talk about wars and fighting. Even during their bath later on, Ikta and Yatori still discuss wars and family feuds. The next day, Yatori and Ikta are taken to a shed in the middle of the woods for a geographical survey. Upon getting there, their entourage suddenly remembers an important tool he forgot in their settlement. So he gets up and treks back there with his partner, leaving Ikta and Yatori to the harsh weather in the woods. Ikta revels in his freedom and heads outside to get some firewood. However, he's attacked by a pack of wolves and would have been eaten if not for Yatori, who pulled him back inside the shed and locked the door. After assessing how dire their situation is, Ikta and the warrior Yatori both figure out the weapons at their disposal, and also how much time they have till their entourage returns to them. They cook up a plan and wait till nightfall before attacking the wolves. When it gets dark enough, they strategically open some spots in the shed and lure about three wolves in so they can wound them and hopefully get them to give up the chase. Sadly for the kids, 
Their plan doesn't work, as the wolves were super hungry from the drought. Ikta and Yatori sit inside to have some dinner before continuing their warfare against the wolves. A few minutes later, the next wave of wolves shows, and this time, they're with their leader. Ikta and Yatori hide inside a trapdoor underneath and try to injure as many wolves as they can, but soon enough, the wolves figure out their plan and attack them all. When it comes down to it, Yatori tells Ikta to save himself and let her be eaten by the wolves. One of them dying is much better than two. Ikta gets really irritated at her thinking and lets her know he's there for her. They're going to work together and bring down the wolves in no time. Yatori gives working together a shot and sets a fire inside the shed so the wolves are forced to rush outside through the exit. This plan works for a few minutes until a few of the wolves break out and corner them. Yatori takes out one of them, but then the last two wolves standing pins their back against each other to eat them up. Just then, one other smaller wolf shows up and calls her remaining two warriors back to the pack. Just like that, Ikta and Yatori are saved from certain death. The next morning, Ikta has breakfast with Yatori and lets her know never to forget how well they work together. After that arc of their lives, Ikta disappeared and his father was imprisoned. Yatori had to live a few more years without her best friend. However, one day, Ikta returned to her a grown man ready to protect her against the real dangers of the world. In the present day, Matthew challenges Harrow to a game of chess with high hopes of winning this time. Lucky for him, he actually beats Harrow at her own game. When they're done, Harrow applauds his efforts and tells him he'll soon beat Ikta and Yatori in their own game very soon. Matthew gets a little sad and tells her that's never going to happen as he knows those two are levels way ahead of him. This doesn't mean Matthew gives up though. Rather than throw in the stick and the coward's way out, Matthew decides to get back up and go study battle strategies so he can be better than his rivals. Later that night, Torway visits the shooting range to continue target practice. While at it, he recalls the previous shot he made at Ison to save Yatori, and appreciates himself for taking such a bold step to stop the downtrodden captain from taking out a core member of his team. On top of that, he's happier to have finally recognized the best distances to shoot his target from. The following day, Harrow finds Ikta sleeping near a tree while reading through a particular text containing information on a safe known as Anarai's box. Harrow gets a little interested in hearing what Ikta had to say, so she asks him a few questions about his origins and Ikta tells her about his father, Bata Sankrai, before getting up to meet the others. Ikta finds Matthew and Torway complaining about their imminent trip to the northern region to check up on the Synax. He cuts in and discusses a few of his adventures back when he was there on a visit. According to him, Synax women are usually voluptuous and pleasing to the eyes. Matthew and Torway are in many ways disgusted by how indecent Ikta can become when he's not thinking of strategies for war. At one point, the girls pass by and stop to say hi to the boys. As expected, Ikta runs his mouth and says a few derogatory things about Harrow's attire. Yatori kicks his crotch and makes him apologize to Harrow for insulting her. Then Shamil speaks up about the six-month-long trip to the north to hold some duty posts there. She asks Yatori if she's okay with such a demeaning task. Yatori only smiles and tells her she's fine with anything that exposes her to a real battle. Up next, Kana, one of the officer candidates currently serving in the northern mountains, receives word of the arrival of the fresh officer candidates from the fort. Upon reaching the gates of the northern garrison fort, Ikta and his people stand by to listen to a boring speech made by the fort's Lord Lieutenant General Safida. When he's done, he holds a banquet in honor of the new officers and toasts a long-lasting relationship with them. Amidst all the celebrations, the fort lord's aide, Major Talk, calls the attention of everyone in the room to disseminate some information about what they'll all be doing at the moment. While he discusses everything they'll be doing, Ikta and his men talk about the weird look on Talk's face. Then they all get down to enjoy the rest of their evening once he's done with the speech. Ikta hangs around somewhere in the corner to observe the entire hall. While he's at it, First Lieutenant Sempa Sazaluf approaches him and discusses a few things with him after the necessary introductions. According to what he's heard about Ikta, Sempa knows him to be an odd one and asks him why that's so. Ikta talks about just how lowly he thinks of parties and celebrations. He then spots Torway, the handsome guy getting all the ladies and curses at him for being so lucky. Just then, Platoon Commander Dainkun gets on stage and calls out Yatori Igsem from the Igsem clan to come fight him in a mock duel. Yatori steps forward and Dainkun throws her a dual sword. Yatori, out of respect, throws one of the swords away and chooses to fight Dainkun fair and square. Mere minutes after the fight begins, Yatori beats the general in front of everyone. Dainkun appreciates Yatori's valor and shakes hands with her as a comrade in arms. Shamil is left in awe of how amazing Yatori's power is. Ikta lets her know that Yatori was doing all this just to ensure peace and order in the Empire. Hours later, Sempa, Ikta, and the others all set out to the mountains to scout for food and keep the Sinak mountain people in check. On their way there, Sempa lets Yatori and her crew know how lucky they are to be there at the best possible time. When asked why, he tells them things haven't been that rosy with the mountain people since the fall of the eastern garrison. 
Now that things are a little normal, they need to get up there to the mountain people and show their forces to them so they don't think of trying to rebel against them. In other words, one could conclude that these mountainous people were being forced to work for the empire and give them supplies with little to no pay. Sempa gets a little worried and asks around for Ikta. Suya, however, answers him with a message from Ikta himself, informing him of his decision to enter the detention barracks due to violating military regulations and acting like a criminal. At this point, there was nothing Sempa could do again. Back in the fort, one of the first Louis is seen confiscating Kana's books as he thinks they're an unnecessary thing to have in the fort. Ikta shows up at the right time and calls the general out on his BS. Apparently, the general wanted to sell the books to the highest bidder and wasn't going to have any regrets doing that. The lieutenant tries to defend himself, but then again, Ikta is only adding more fire to the stove. In the end, he drops the most important book to Kana and tries to push Ikta to a wall. Ikta lures him into a spider's den and lets it fall on the lieutenant's shirt when he hits the wall. The lieutenant runs away from the irritation and leaves Ikta with the cute Kana. Ikta pulls off one of his tricks on Kana and charms her into telling him a few more things about her studies. Shortly afterwards, Sempa comes along and drags him back. Ikta tries to discuss a little bit with Sempa, but then his punishment is already set. Sempa takes Ikta to the dungeons and imprisons him. Before he gets into his cave, however, Ikta senses something and rushes towards one of the cells. There, he finds something so preposterous that he rather not show. At that moment, a few rebels from the Senac gather up to fight the northern garrison for abducting their sprites for no apparent reason. A few days later, Dainkun finds Yatori and her people in the dining hall, having some breakfast. He tries to challenge Torway to a fight, but then again, Shamil cuts in and prevents Dainkun from mocking her soldiers in front of her. Upon hearing this, Dainkun bows his head and apologizes greatly for disrespecting the princess in front of her people. When he's done, he walks away after promising Torway that he'd be back for round two. Ikta shows up a little while later looking like a walking corpse and begs his colleagues to serve him some water. Luckily for him, his colleagues do that before asking questions. In a matter of minutes, Ikta is back to normal, and he finds himself resting on the princess's lap. Yatori commands him to get off the lap and feeds him a little snack to munch on. Shortly afterwards, Yatori and her people head out to the mountains to get supplies from the Sinak mountain people. On their way, Yatori and Major Toak discuss a little bit about wars and peace. Eventually, they get to the capital of the mountain people and dock there while their carriage gets filled with the stuff they need. While that happens, Ikta meets with Kana and chats a little bit with her. Later on, he heads towards a store and politely asks the elderly woman there to give them something to drink. After getting their drinks, Ikta and Kana continue moving further into the city, discussing the delirious role of Major Toak in upholding the eastern fort. From his discussion with Kana, Ikta realizes that the lord of the fort itself, Safida, was a dundee who left all the administrative work to poor Major Toak. Moving on, Kana tells Ikta about the eerie doings of Safida and explains that sometimes he abducts the sprites of the Senek people just to bully them and assert his dominance over their race. Upon hearing this, Ikta suddenly remembers what he saw in the dungeons a few days ago. Apparently, Safida had instructed Sempa and the soldiers to capture all the sprites currently dwelling in the Senak residence. Back then, Ikta had noticed the fire and wind spirit type sprites dwelling in multitudes in the dungeons, and had warned Sempa back then that the lieutenant general seemed to be provoking the Senak people to a war. Just then, Kana brings him back to normal and tells him about the abnormal ways of the teachings of the people of Sinak. Apparently, the Sinax never for once promoted the Alderam and deity in their teachings, and Kana found it weird and all. In the meantime, Major Tok, his men, and Yatori go on an official visit to the Sinak people's palace for a meeting. Yatori splits up with them to do her thing, leaving Tok and his officers to enter the building. On getting inside, they find the entire palace to be awfully silent, which is a little bit unlikely. Tok walks further to their meeting place and finds their POI dead from a stab wound. Meanwhile, Kana and Ikta continue their discussions over the Aldera region and the sprites. After mouthing a few things to Ikta, he holds her and congratulates her for breaking off the horrible beliefs of the Aldera Min religion. He twirls Kana around as he praises her for finally seeing the truth behind the facade. Kana, who's initially confused, eventually smiles only to stop her smile when they hear a sudden gunshot from the distance. Moments after hearing the gunshot from the Sinak Palace, Yatori rushes over there and takes out some of the enemy forces before leaving the rest to escape. Ikta and Kana rush towards the palace to investigate the crime scene. They carefully check around the conference room until they find the blue Alderan pilgrimage clothes which are quite unusual for the Sinak people to wear. As they discuss, Yatori gathers her men and chases after the Sinak people. However, she locates their ambush up ahead and quickly orders her men to stop. After making a full halt, Yatori asks the rebel leader why she's attacking their comrades. 
The Sinak leader explains the entire crime of the eastern garrison to Yatori. Yatori asks her about the demands they all want from the army so things can return to the way they originally were. However, the Sinak rebels, who were already sick and tired of being treated like dogs in their own lands, declared war on the eastern garrison. By evening time, Safita receives the heartbreaking news, but instead of reporting this to the Empire as a whole, Safita decides to fight a small war and hopefully subdue the rebels before the Empire hears about it. Also, if the entire thing blows up in his face, then they can play the victim and seek more reinforcements from the Empire. Soon after, news of the Holy War circulates the eastern garrison fort and everyone but Dainkun supports it. While drinking in the dining hall, Dainkun gets up and tells him why fighting a war isn't the best option available to them. Meanwhile, Ikta recounts the real meaning of war to the Sinak mind. To them, war means survival of the fittest and they would stop at nothing to gain their freedom back. Yatori gets a little curious and asks Ikta why they may be so provoked to fight the garrison. Ikta remains ambiguous and tells her someone must be giving them excuses to fight the wars. Later that night, everyone gets informed of the punitive expedition the eastern garrison is to launch on the Sinak people the following day. When the next day comes, Shamil instructs all her imperial knights to ensure they all come back alive. After giving her an okay signal, they all get down to spectate the fort and discuss strategy before the real war begins. When it comes down to it, Ikta and his people are briefed on the first battle there to fight. After the briefing, Ikta takes Torway to a secret room and shows him the new air rifles they have to get used to in a short time. Later on, the fort begins the war against the Sinak people, with Ikta and Yatori being placed in charge of their respective platoons. On the next day after the war, Ikta and his people continued moving up towards the mountain's summit. Along the line, Ikta complains about the poor decision-making from the higher-ups to Suya. Despite it being freezing cold in the mountains ahead, Safita still marched his men blindly to fight the Sinak people, who were already used to the mountains. Anyway, Ikta and his people all meet up with the rest of the army up on the mountain. There, Ikta realizes the terrible conditions the soldiers had to endure in the name of waiting for the right time to strike. He checks around the camp a bit and finds several sick soldiers being taken to the infirmary for treatment. In the meantime, Safita sits in his war room complaining of how slow their assault has been these past few days. He thinks the Sinakans are a bunch of war monkeys that need to be wiped out quickly. As soon as they receive word from Safita, the first lieutenant in the camp up ahead briefs Ikta and his people on the things they're to do before the next wave begins. Ikta and his people, after getting the memo, head out of the camp to continue traveling up the mountain to get more medical supplies. After trekking and complaining for hours, they finally arrive at an abandoned fort a few meters away. The commanding officer instructs Ikta and his men to set up camp in the abandoned fort for a few days so they can recuperate and continue their journey. That night, Ikta finds Haro doing her medical thing. He calls her attention and engages her in a few discussions about the state of the soldiers in their camp. Haro sheepishly suggests they write a proposal to the commanding officers to have their new medical ward situated somewhere closer to the ground level to hasten their recovery. Ikta reasons with her suggestions and moves on to talk about other things. Before he talks extensively, the warning bell signals an enemy attack and calls the attention of every soldier in the camp. In a matter of minutes, everyone gathers together and immediately makes plans to subdue the incoming enemy attacks. Ikta and Yatori, after dishing out orders to their platoons, walk forward a little bit and find several of their men running away as they are being chased from behind. All platoon leaders immediately make their forces man their stations. Moments before the battle begins, Matthew calls Ikta and asks him for some tips on how to stay calm and brave during a battle as dire as the one coming. Ikta calmly talks him through overcoming his fears and it apparently works. When they see the enemy line, Ikta and his people initially blind the enemy forces with their partner's beam lights, and then use the temporary blindness to their advantage to attack the enemies. The battle only lasts a few minutes, and Ikta's side gets a flawless victory after eliminating all their enemies. After the battle, Ikta returns to a secluded spot to discuss with his new flame, Kana. Together, the duo talk and joke about Kana's sudden love for books after her husband died a few months after they were married. She also talks about a master she used to train under before she got into the military. Just then, the bell sounds again, and this time, they realize that they've been had. Apparently, the enemy left the fortress empty when they arrived, just to get them to be very comfortable so they could attack them. Before the attack gets too dire, Ikta and his men flee the fortress to fight another day. The next day, Najiru, one of the commanding officers, complains and blames Ikta for retreating upon seeing enemy fire. He was supposed to stand, fight, and get killed the warrior way. Ikta scoffs at the lieutenant's cowardly attempt to cover his own fear. Rather than call him out on his BS, Ikta decides to make a bet with him. If he can retake the fort from the enemy in an hour using his own select forces, then Najiru will have to leave them alone. Seems fair enough to the cowardly lieutenant, 
so he gives Ikta the order. Up next, Ikta scopes the entire fort and has his snipers placed several meters away from the fort. While Matthew complains about the impossibility of the missions, giving the artilleries at their disposal, Matthew isn't wrong to protest Ikta's plans. Ikta waits for the right time to strike. When it comes, he marches his army towards the fort gates and waits for the signal from Torway. Just then, Torway and two other gunners aim their new and improved air rifles with maddening range at the enemy and snipe every one of the enemies on the fort cannons. When they're all down, Ikta and his men charge and retake the fortress from them, all within the hour. After the battle, Ikta and his friends take a little resting time somewhere in the ruins and Ikta discusses a few details about the new artillery they just acquired. Amidst their discussion, Harrow rushes to inform them of the terrible news. Apparently, one of the soldiers from Kana's fort just arrived at theirs to tell them about his fort getting attacked a few meters ahead of the fort. After hearing all he had to say, Ikta orders his men to keep the encounter with the soldier a secret, so they can try to solve it quickly before it all gets tricky. Ikta then takes his men up towards the mountain summit, and stops midway to rest up his men for about two days. This would allow them to rest up and get used to the mountain air. Although his subordinates protest this, Ikta makes them understand his point of view. Elsewhere, Kana is seen running helter-skelter to cater for her people who were dropping dead like flies from the harsh mountain weather. Ikta and his platoon rest up for two days, and continue moving shortly afterwards. When they get to the fort, however, they only meet hundreds of bodies littering the entire fort. Ikta and his party walk atop the fort wall to check the bodies. Unfortunately for Ikta, he stumbled upon Kana, his new flame's body. He recognizes her body from amongst the others, and wishes her a safe journey to the afterlife. Ikta keeps his emotions hidden, and presses on to meet with Sempa and his forces in the Alifatra mountain range camp, situated about 3,800 meters above sea level. On getting there, Sempa, who is shocked to see Ikta and his people, reprimands Ikta and his people for risking their lives and coming to the top of the mountains to join them. Ikta and his people sit him down and explain the situation to him. In the end, Captain Sempa understands their situation and brings them up to speed on the situation of the war. He opens the map of the entire terrain and explains where their platoons are situated for a surprise attack. Ikta notices a flaw in the plan and lets Sempa know about it. Eventually, Sempa tells him not to worry about it and just let them move forward from that place. To do that, he assigns Ikta to be the head of a company of all five platoons. Their first mission is to get to the locale of the Sinak people and set fire to their houses after evacuating all of them. Ikta gets right down to his task and makes sure to evacuate every last one of the Sinakans before doing so. While escorting them to another village deep in the mountains, Ikta discusses the logic behind their strategy with Suya. He makes sure to explain the captain's plans to her to make her understand the gist. When they get to the new camp, a little boy from the evacuees rushes outside from the crowd and bites Ikta's clothes to avenge his village. Ikta gets a little irritated and taps the boy on the nose, causing him to bleed through the nose. As the little boy cries out, Dainkan shows up and punches Ikta for causing harm to such an innocent, brave boy. He bends down and gives the boy a napkin to clean himself up while he also punches himself to punish himself for having to fight them. After comforting the boy, he walks to Ikta, who is just getting his bearings, and asks for his comments on the matter. Ikta thanks him for the scolding and walks away. Suya follows him and complains about Ikta's negligence. She thinks treating the villagers with care and concern is bad for the army since they were sent to kill them initially. Ikta calms her down and lets her know that he's totally fine with the punishment, as he did step out of line with the kid. Moments after returning to their base, every soldier in the fort gathered to hear Safita's speech about their next war move, which was to begin the following day. When they're done, Ikta and the others all settle down in the making shift cafe. There, Ikta talks about the sheer number of men they've lost to sickness alone, which is estimated to be more than half of the 18,000 men present initially. The girls excuse themselves to take their last bath before their battle the next day. The following day, Sempa leads his forces through the narrow pathways by the side of the mountain to get to the enemy camp. On their way there, Torway complains about their choice of battleground to Sempa, letting him know just how hard it'll be to place mortars against the enemy. Soon after, Ikta shows up from behind and explains his own strategy to Sempa, which is for them to take out their shields and protect themselves while they march up towards their battleground. Eventually, they all go with the plan and continue marching on foot with valor. Little did they know that the infamous ghost squad, Karla Karm, resides and operates from caves above them. They receive the signal from their people of the enemy's movements and prepare themselves to attack Sempa's forces in silence. In just a few more minutes, the Sinak people attack Ikta's forces by shooting arrows towards them. Almost immediately, enemies show up from all sides to attack Ikta and his people. Dainkun saves Ikta and Haro from imminent death and gets them back up to fight another day. Ikta mentions a few motivating words and continues fighting the enemy, Soon enough, the chieftain of the Sinak tribe, Nanakudaru, 
shows up and challenges Yatori to a one versus one with Liberty to use their sprites in the fight. After introducing themselves and mouthing a few derogatory things at themselves, Nanaku charges towards Yatori in a weird dancing blade fashion. Yatori is forced to defend the attacks and learn Nanaku's moves. At that time, Karla Karm arrives at the battlefield and takes down some of Ikta's men. Meanwhile, Yatori, after learning all of Nanaku's moves, finally subdues her and stabs her sprite, Hisha, which is located at her back. Hisha sacrifices herself for the cause and saves her partner in return. At that instant, Yatori finds Danekun stabbed by one of the Karla Karm. She lunges herself at the soldiers and chases him away. Later that evening, Danekun passes away from the stab wounds after leaving a heartwarming message to Yatori and the others. That night, Nanaku returns to her village only to find it in flames. Nine years ago, during the festival period of the Sanakan people, young Nanaku sneaks off into Ikta's room to catch him unawares and be with him, alone. On getting there, she asks Ikta to sleep with her and fulfill his role as her future husband. Thankfully, nothing happened between them as they were still kids. Back in the present day, Nanaku rushes towards an open tent and finds about five enemy soldiers there. She finds two of her people's bodies on the ground and goes mad in a fit of rage. She rushes towards the men and takes out about two of them before she's captured and kept aside for their pleasure later on. In the meantime, Ikta and his comrades who were just arriving at the village they previously set fire to, quickly rushed towards the same camp Nanaku attacked earlier. They made it just in time before the three men graped the poor girl. Ikta gets super pissed and knocks them all down before saving his childhood friend. The very next day, Ikta and his people gather around to take the spoils from the battle. Now that the enemy camp is desolate and warrior-free, they can finally rest and return home to end the battle. Before doing that, however, Ikta tells them about the Karla Karm and their involvement with the Kyokin squad. Apparently, Ikta suspects that the Kyokin army had something to do with the entire Sanakan attack, as he feels they were way too coordinated for a set of mountain people. Soon after, Safita shows up blabbing nonsense from his mouth as expected. Before he gets to say too much, Someone from the Aldera inspection team shows up to investigate a certain allegation against the northern garrison. From the looks of things, someone told of Safida's immoral habit of being mean to the sprite spirits. After several allegations from that same location, the knights from the Alderamin religion came by to see for themselves. The inspector checks around the ruins and finds dozens of dead sprites scattered along the ruins. He immediately gets the info he needs and rides back to his people. Scared, Safida orders his men to go after the inspector and take them all out before they get to him. Sempa gathers a handful of men and rides towards the direction of the inspector. They stop somewhere along the way and find thousands of holy knights marching up the mountains towards their location. Ikta immediately realizes the foul play here and assumes the Kyoka Republic was manipulating Sinak and the priests of Aldera into attacking the Empire. Although their tactics are a little sneaky, Ikta appreciates the efforts of the brilliant mind who cooked up this plan to kill two birds with a stone. Upon realizing what was happening, Safidon calls for a meeting and orders his men to prepare a battalion to attack the knights head-on. However, Sempa decides to try a different route to retreat to the backlines and attempt to delay the enemy line until something miraculous happens. The generals seem to like his plan, so they give him the floor to explain everything. Yatori takes up the speech and explains the entire plan to the generals there, promising them to use all 600 men at their disposal to take down the army of 12,000 men. On top of that, Ikta swears to help convince Sinak to help them with their mission. Safida is a little surprised by this, but then again, he allows his men to do their thing. Later that night, Ikta takes Nanaku, whom he rescued previously, and takes her to his separate camp for a brief discussion. Initially, Nanaku frowns at Ikta for having the audacity to come back to mock them, the losers of the war, just to patronize and use them in their upcoming war against the Holy Army. Ikta, who knows the extent of the damage they've done to the Sinakan people, goes extreme in his apology, and cuts his pinky finger three times just to show Nanaku how serious he is with his apology. After getting her full attention, he tells her about the Holy Knights and their relationship with the Kyoka Republic before reminding her about their childhood days and revealing his real identity to Nanaku. Nanaku, whose heart had already been won, eventually forgoes the casualties the war had on her people and opts in to help the Empire fight the Holy Knights. After the negotiations, Ikta gets to call the chieftain of the Sinak people, Nana just like in old times. He leaves the bewildered Nanaku in the tent and heads back to his camp after giving his finger the first aid treatment it needs. On his way back home with Yatori, Ikta discusses the reasons why he needed to be the one to handle the negotiation. Eventually, he joins the others and Senpa who informs them of their promotions to first and second lutines and the like. He congratulates Yatori and Ikta for making it all the way to the top as first lutines, 
and tells the others of his intentions to send them back to the rear to wait for orders. Matthew gets a little pissed at the demeaning nature of their decision and confronts Icta for thinking that lowly of them. He wants to fight on the front lines and would do anything he can to protect Icta and the other colleagues. Icta senses the resolve in his voice and finally lets them all fight together. Two days later, everyone begins setting the traps and things they'd need following Icta's plans. When the general of the Holy Knights' army sees the fire burning the forest connecting them and their enemies, he laughs out loud and calls his own strategist to provide him with the best counter to their puny tactics. Seconds later, the strategist showed up to assess the situation. In the meantime, Icta visits the infirmary to get his pinky finger treated. There, he gets to have a tete-a-tete -tete with Hero about the burdens he's been forced to carry during his exploits with them on the mountain. Soon after, Yatori shows up and invites Icta to the front lines. There, they talk about the mysterious strategist who works for the Kyokan army and mention just how relentless he is in his search for new strategies that work. While they wait for the knights to make their first move, Jean, the best strategist in all of Kyoka, who's also on par with Icta's strength, is seen scribbling various words and things on lots of paper around him. Jin, one of the Kyoka Luras, shows up and asks him to slow his balls down so he doesn't overwork himself. However, Jin was only interested in the genius who was behind the plan to burn down the forest and buy the Empire soldiers enough time to escape before they attacked. From the way the plan was set up, he knows the strategist on the Empire's side, aka Ikta, must be pretty darn good. He stops to think about Safita achieving such a feat, but then again, even the dumbest person in Kyoka knows that it's both physically and mentally impossible for someone like Safita to achieve such an impossible task. So, who could it be? To stop her boss from overthinking, Gin suggests it being a coincidence, as it's not that impossible for things of that nature to happen every now and then. However, Jean knows this is pure ingenuity at work, so he gets a little marveled as he starts to think about who the person is. Meanwhile, Shamil, sleeping in the comfort of the surface level, has a bad dream about Ikta waking up only to find her room as silent as a graveyard. Seconds later, one of the guards shows up to tell her the heartbreaking news about the campaign the Holy Army of Aldera is holding against the Empire. The following day, Ikta calls for his friends and Sempa to host a war meeting. Although the odds are against them, they still manage to figure out a way, especially now that there's no way for the Holy Army to directly come at them. However, there's a narrow pathway the Holy Army can pass through just to get to the rear side of their army. Ikta plans to stall the enemy long enough for them to form an ambush in that narrow way so that when they eventually have to pass through, Ikta and his people can be ready to pounce on them. His plans actually work as Jean advises the commander of the Holy Army to wait a little bit before passing by. When asked why that's so, the commander tells them he wants to figure out who the brilliant person behind the Empire's army is. In the meantime, Ikta has his men put up barricades to prevent the Aldera army from progressing too much. Ikta intends to hold them off for eight days, which is usually enough time for the entire fleet to escape the attack. Hours after the barricades have been put up, the Alderan army notices the fires going down and prepares themselves for a night raid. Meanwhile, Ikta, Senpa, and the other men all wait patiently near their barricades for the enemy to come at them. Ikta finds Senpa worried about Karla Karm and advises him not to think too much about ghosts and the like. Senpa scratches his head and thanks Ikta for the help. That night, Ikta and his people all waited near their barricades for the enemy to come. While at it, the voices in Ikta's head start discouraging Ikta from making any more plans. Ikta hushes the words in his head and decides to focus more on the battle in front of him. Seconds later, the front line of the Alderan army proceeded, and they all opened fire on all of them. After getting all of them down, Ikta and his enemy realize that those men were there to block the trajectory of their cannons in preparation for a second wave. Yatori refuses to let them win, as she increases the cannon's trajectory and fights the holy army head-on. Nanaku also joins them and ends up killing a few of them. Yatori, however, stops midway and realizes that the remaining enemies have run away. A little while later, the second wave comes in with air rifles to shoot at their enemies. Jean follows them to see the kind of artillery the enemy possesses. After nearly getting his head cut off, Jean realizes there must be a wonderful strategist in the Kyokan army. One of the soldiers came to report the succession of the second wave, so Jean sends the third wave and their heavy-duty cannons to the enemy. On seeing the incoming cannons, Ikta struggles to make a decision. Should he save Yatori and Nanaku and risk killing some of his men, or do they just abandon them and save themselves? Ikta opts in to save his friends. He gives the order and divides his people into two. They rush towards the front line and defend themselves while recovering the injured Sinakans. When they're done, they all retreat into the dense vegetation and block the passageway. Jean and his forces return to the general, who seems to be complaining every chance he gets. 
Jean calms him down and tells him not to fret yet. Although they didn't win this battle, they still haven't lost. Upon getting back to their tents, Suya and Torwi realize just how bad the casualties they all suffered were. Suya kept her cool as best as she could up until she heard Matthew, who was shot in the arm, talk about how lucky he was to be alive. The thought pisses Suya off as she runs towards Ikta and blames him for being so emotionless about losing some of his comrades in war just to save a few Sinak barbarians. Ikta stays quiet and takes the brunt of all the harsh words Suya has to say to him. Despite his childhood friend Nanaku standing by his side, Ikta still decides to defend her. Yatori cuts in in a few seconds and tells her to stop accusing the wrong people of what happened to her friends. She corrects Suya, and takes responsibility for saving the Sinakans and sacrificing her enemies. At this point, Sinak is their ally and there's nothing they can do but protect them at all costs without being emotionless. Suya gets very emotional and asks Yatori if she could bring herself to kill Ikta if she had no choice. Yatori tells her she'd do it without a doubt as her clan has been a clan of warriors without no remorse for carrying out their duties. Suya gets fed up with the monsters beside her and just runs away. Ikta, before leaving, asks Yatori how she plans on killing him. Yatori gives him an accurate description and hopes he understands that she practically had no choice. Ikta accepts his fate and continues on his way. The next day, the Karla Karm receive a missive from their allies at the front line to head out and attack the rear guard of the Empire. Elsewhere, Shamil gets up and readies herself to go meet Safida and his band of merry cowards in the dining hall as they wait for her. Annoyed, Shamil condemns Safida and his men for being so cowardly and abandoning their own soldiers to save their own skin. Safida tries to make a nasty move against the young Shamil, but then again Shamil counters him and informs him of his court-martial after the war. As Safida and his men gasp for breath, Shamil walks towards the window and calls out Ikta's name softly and wishes he would return home to her in good health. Meanwhile, Ikta hosts a meeting with his comrades to inform them of the new strategy for their warfare. Ikta advises his people to stand by and be alert as they watch what Jean and his own army of about 10,000 soldiers will do to them in a few days. While the Empire's forces wait, Jean wakes up and stretches himself to fit in the morning. Gin shows up with a message from the Allies in the Rear Mountains. Upon reading it, Jean finds out about Yatori Igsim, the extraordinary warrior who fought the Ghost Warriors fair and square, and begins to mistake her for the genius behind the wild forest fire. Back at the Empire camp, Nanaku finds Suya checking the bodies of the comrades who lost their lives just to save her and her people. She walks up to Suya and offers both her arms as restitution for causing the deaths of her comrades. Before she does that, however, she begs Suya to let her fight her wars to the end before taking both her hands. On hearing this, Suya breaks down in tears and realizes just how hard it is to be a soldier as she never thought she'd have to fight so many senseless wars. Sempa finds her lacking and walks up close to her to calm her nerves. He mouths a few things to her and makes Suya laugh before asking for Ikta's location. Suya takes Sempa to Ikta who is sleeping on the straw in his tent and joins the others to watch the genius sleep. Shortly afterwards, a soldier shows up and informs the crew about the 500 Alderian soldiers passing the bypass behind them and charging towards them. Ikta wakes up that instant and conducts an emergency war meeting with Sempa and the others. They contemplate sending a force to intercept the enemy line, but then again, Sempa tells them to let him go do that instead, while they remain at the base and lead it while he's away. He gives another mouthful of reasons to go there and they eventually let him go. Ikta, however, hands him Torway and his air rifle unit so they can direct long-range attacks as well. Moments later, Torway and his men leave the base with Sempa and his men as well. Soon after they leave, Harrow and Matthew find a blimp flying over their base. They peer their eyes to see who's piloting the thing, and find Jean and his assistant, Gin, piloting it. Apparently, the white-haired dude, Jean, was there to scout the enemy land and figure out their plans before returning to make his own plans. From his binoculars, he finds an enemy force heading west and takes note. Not so far away, the General of the Holy Knights sees Jean's blimp flying over the enemy base and throws a fit at this dastardly act as it was considered unholy. In the end, the General forgoes all things holy and decides to do anything within his disposal to win the battle. When Ikta sees the blimp, he rushes towards his men who were already distracted and tells them to focus on restoring the flame barriers when the forest fire burns out and take out as many enemies as they can while at it. So for the next seven days, they have to keep cool and be lazy for them to win. When they're done with their task, they retreat properly away from the mountains. Somewhere around the bypass fortress, Sempa finally saw the enemy progressing towards them. He calls for his people to read the six mortars they were able to bring up to the spot and position them to fight the enemy. At that instant, Ikta sends Matthew and his men to rekindle the forest fires by setting logs ablaze. When they're done, Matthew notices the enemy soldiers holding air rifles and hiding in the woods waiting to fire at them. He sounds the alarm and gets his men to defend themselves against the incoming fire. After their great fight, Ikta orders a four-hour rest for Matthew and his people. In the meantime, Ikta finds out about the blimps and asks Nana about a possible eastern route. 
Nana tells him there's no way there's an eastern route towards the bypass route. Conversely, Sempa and his people notice the enemy retreating after leaving their back open. Sempa gets a little confused initially as to why this happened. Moments before it's too late, Sempa and Torway realize that they're going to be attacked on the rear side of their army. At that instant, the ghost soldiers take their positions and ready themselves to fire upon signals. When the time is right, the ghost soldiers get up to fire at the rear side of the camp. Their leader raises his hand to sound the signal, but before he's able to do it, Torway and his snipers shoot and defeat them all before they fire a single shot. Apparently, Ikta had already seen through Jean's plan and had prepared ahead of it. Torway gives Ikta's plan one last thought and fires every last shot in his bullet to take down most of the Kala Karm. The remaining Karms try to flee, but then again, they meet their demise up front and are wiped off the face of the earth. That night, Ikta receives news of Torway's victory. He orders them to remain in their positions for three more days before they retreat. Once the reporting soldier's gone, Yatori arrives with some food for Ikta. Ikta goes on a little picnic with Yatori and discusses the most recent happenings in their fight against the Holy Knights and the Kyokan warriors. Ikta mentions a few burdens he carries and tells Yatori he joined the military to ease himself of those burdens. The duo have a little silence before finishing their food. On the morning of the sixth day in the battle, Ikta gets wind of the enemy pulling off some super heavy artillery with six wagons. This puzzles him a little, so he sends out a few of his men to go find out what those things are. While Ikta's men do that, Jean and his men unsheathe their super advanced cannons and load them up with balls. Then, they tighten the mechanism and fire the cannonballs at the Empire's base. Ikta and his men could hear the rumbles from the shockwave as the cannonballs hit the ground. Soon after, horses belonging to the Holy Knights begin to appear towards them. Ikta thinks a little hard and realizes that Jean and his people have been training all these days. Ikta thought they were fooling them. Now that they have just two days left till they can make a successful retreat, they have to protect the rear guard at all costs. Ikta holds another emergency war meeting with his soldiers. After pointing out Jean's strategy, Ikta gets a little confused and blames himself for not grasping the entire situation at hand. In the end, he thinks of a solution and instructs Matthew to guard the area while they're gone to fight the enemy on the front lines. Nanaku, who suspects Ikta trying to keep her away from the fight, confronts him and eventually gets to fight alongside him. Matthew gets cold as he begins to question his own ability to protect the camp for the next two days. Ikta stops and tells him to defend the camp by all means, but in no way is he allowed to die trying. Matthew gets the gist and gets on to continue his work. Soon after, Ikta and his party leave the camp to meet up with Jean and his forces ahead. On their way, they find the thin, narrow way leading to the enemy's battlefront and realize that they have to completely defeat the enemy in their own game, or else there'll be no win for them. Ikta gets off his horse and thinks long and hard before finally coming up with a wonderful idea. That night, they set up a trap for Jean and his people on the way and waited for them to approach them. When Jean and his people show up, they stop up front when they find hay scattered all over the pathway with oil smells coming from them. Jean gets way ahead of himself and makes sure his men don't cross directly over the hay to avoid getting burned. Ikta and his men allow Jean's men to get close enough. Then, when the time is right, Ikta gives the order and the oil smell disappears. Jean realizes his mistake way too late as Ikta's men come out of the hay and kill off as many of Jean's soldiers as they possibly can. Jean tries calling for reinforcements, but then Yatori and her people attack from the rear. In the meantime, Jean sits on his horse freaking out over the chaos on the battlefield in front of him. Then, in a few minutes, he finds the flag of surrender in the hands of a soldier from the Empire. Jean gets to make the tough decision. Does he fold and discuss things, or does he continue fighting and risk getting to a stalemate with the Empire? Ikta prays silently for Jean to take the bait. Thankfully, Jean does just as he's about to be stabbed in the head by an enemy soldier. Jean calls for a negotiation and goes to meet Yatori, the person he thought to be the commander of the garrison. To his surprise, however, Ikta steps forward and introduces himself as the garrison's commander. Jean gets acquainted with him and lays out his terms to Ikta, which is a full surrender from the Empire's side. Ikta counters his terms and tells him to retreat so they can have enough time to retreat to their main base and set fire to the front lines. Jean doesn't go with this as he thinks he's invincible. However, Ikta bursts his bubble when he lights up a pathway to Jean's chest to signal his invisible sniper from several meters away to take him out. Now that he faces the threat of being eliminated, Jean gets more restive. He thinks a little bit about the situation and realizes there's a 90% chance Ikta's bluffing. This, however, wasn't enough for him as the other 10% would be a very risky bet to take. Jean eventually decides to save his own life, so he accepts Ikta's terms and provides them a passageway to retreat to their base. On hearing his answer, Ikta pays his respects to his fellow strategist and escorts him back to the forest front. After setting fire to the logs and reigniting the barrier, Jean and Ikta discuss a few things about the people and the nation protecting them. By the end of their conversation, Ikta lets the restless general know that laziness triumphs above all. 
as it's one of the best ways humans have been progressing through evolution. Jean leaves shortly afterwards and Ikta collapses. Yatori and one other soldier take Ikta through the mountains to get him to the camp for treatment. However, they're attacked by a ghost warrior from a noble family who calls himself Nerva Gin. He captures Ikta and holds him at knife point, threatening to end him if Yatori doesn't fight him. In the end, Yatori takes out her dual blade and decides to fight Nerva with all her strength. In the end, she comes up victorious in her fight as she manages to study his movements and stab him in the chest. Nerva dies a hero's death and leaves Ikta and Yatori's hands. After paying her respects to the brave warrior, Yatori removes her sword and paints herself red before going over to check up on the troublesome Ikta. A few days later, everyone returns to the base of the mountain and makes it back to the Empire all in one piece. Shamil rushes outside to check up on all her friends. She checks and makes sure everyone is intact. Then she gets up and addresses the remaining survivors, promising to reward them with land and honor as they live. A month later, Safida, the stupid garrison leader, is tried before the emperor and found guilty of being executed, hanged, and publicly disgraced. That night, Ikta finds the princess staring at the throne in the royal hall. There, Shamil advises him to rise to the top of the imperial knighthood and uproot the corruption of the empire from its core. Ikta tries to protest her ways, but then again, Shamil leaves him with no choice but to go with her wishes to bring the win home. After his meeting with the princess, Ikta joins Yatori upstairs to talk about his dad and the extremely hard work that he did just to make sure the empire is good again. He then selfishly tells Yatori that he's not there to take care of any country. Rather, he's there to protect her to the very end. Yatori smiles and appreciates his efforts to ensure her safety. 